In this lecture, we shall seek to ascertain when the long possession of a person who has possession of land can ripen into ownership. In other words, we shall seek to explore the position of the law in relation to a person who is in possession of land. For how long must the person exercise possession before the person can be deemed to be the owner of the land? In other words, when does long possession of land ripen into ownership of that particular land. Now, by way of summary, the points we shall discuss in this lecture are as follows. First, we shall discuss that a person who is found to be in possession of land that person can successfully maintain an action in trespass against the whole world apart from the true owner. A person who is found to be in possession of land can successfully maintain an action in trespass against the whole world apart from the true owner. The second point we shall explain in this lecture is that an owner of land may be ousted of his title. An owner of land can have his title ousted by a person who is in adverse possession after the person has continued to be in adverse possession for a period of at least 12 years. We shall also explain that before a person can rely on adverse possession to oust an owner of his right to the land, the person who is in adverse possession must exercise act of open visible and apparent possession before he can rely on adverse possession. What this means is that if the possession is secret and the true owner is not aware that you are in possession of the land, then you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor. We shall also explain that even though in our laws, when a person has remained in adverse possession of a land for a period of at least 12 years or more, that person ends up extinguishing the rights of the actual owner of the land. We shall explain that adverse possession does not apply in relation to public lands in Ghana since the passage of the Land Act of 2020, Act 1036. So we shall begin with our first discussion, which highlights the importance of possession in land law. When you read the Evidence Act 1975, NLCD 323, specifically Section 48, Subsection 2, you will notice that it reads as follows, that a person who exercises acts of ownership over property is presumed to be the owner of it. Could end. That a person who is exercising possession of a property is presumed to be the owner of it. It is because of things like this that's when you read the case of Seraphim. Seraphim is spelled S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. Seraphim versus Amasechi. Reported in 
1962 one Ghana law reports at page 328, specifically as holding one. Ole Enuje held as follows, and I quote, a person in possession of land can successfully maintain an action in trespass against the whole world except the true owner, quote ends. So it means that there is crucial importance as far as a person who is in ownership of land is concerned. Ole Nude has told us in Seraphim versus Amwasage that once somebody is in possession of land, he can maintain an action in trespass against the whole world apart from the true owner. And remember what we have also seen under section 48, subsection 2 of the Evidence Act of Ghana, 1975, NRCD 323. But you will notice that the lawmaker didn't say that a person who is in possession is the owner. It says that you shall be presumed to be the owner. So the next point that I now want to explain is the position of the law that no matter how long a person has been in possession of land, he shall not by virtue of such long ownership be automatically be construed to be the owner of the land. In other words, no matter how long a person has exercised an act of possession over the land, it doesn't mean that automatically such a person will be deemed to be the owner of the land. Section 48, subsection 2 says, he shall be presumed to be the owner. Remember also that in the case of Seraphim and Amwasechi, it says you can maintain an action in trespass against the whole world apart from the true owner. It means that we recognize that possession alone will not make you the owner. And this principle that possession, however long a time, shall not ripen into ownership has been established in several cases. First, I shall go through the case of Inchirahene Kojo Adu versus Wusu. Inchirahene is spelled capital N C H I R A A H E N E Kojo K O J O Adu A D D O. Inchirahene versus Wusu. Wusu is spelled W U S U. This is reported in 1938 for West African Court of Appeals at page 96. And this is what was held, and I quote, that long possession alone was not enough to establish right, uh, establish title as customary law because there were no prescriptive rights as customary law. You see, the case is telling us as far back as in the year 1938, that long possession alone was not enough to establish title and customary law. Also, if you look at the case of Latte versus Hauser, Latte is spelled L-A-R-T-E-Y versus Hauser, H-A-U-S-A, -A, reported in 1961, Ghana Law Report at page 773. Ole Nuje also held as follows in holding two of the head notes, and I quote, As customary law, possession, however long, does not ripen into ownership. At customary law, possession, however long, does not ripen into ownership, and the quote ends. And also, if you look at the case of Ehuran, Ehuran is called E-H-U-R-A-N versus Atta, A-T-T-A. Ehuran versus Atta reported in 1960, Ghana Law Report at page 224. The Supreme Court held as follows, and I quote, 
title to land cannot be established by proof of long possession. And the quote ends. Now, all these three cases I have mentioned, in Chua Henry Kojoadu versus Wusu, Late versus Hausa, Ehuan, and Mata, all they are saying is that possession alone, no matter how long it is, will not automatically make you the owner of the land. The question that then arises is that when can long ownership extinguish the rights of the owner of the land? In other words, when does adverse possession extinguish the rights of the original owner of the land? This is what we refer to as limitation of action. And it is governed by the Mutation Act of 1972, NRCD 54, specifically Section 10 thereof. And as a result of its imports, I shall read Section 10, subsection 1, as follows. Section 10, subsection 1 reads as follows, and I quote, a person shall not bring an action to recover land after the expiration of 12 years from the date on which the right of action accrued to the person bringing it if or if it first accrued to a person through whom the first mentioned claims to that person. Now, when you read, you take a critical look at section 10, subsection 1. It says that a person shall not bring an action to recover a land after a period of 12 years from the date on which the right of action accrued to the person bringing it. So that if the right has accrued to you to bring your action, and you fail to bring the action and 12 years expires, then your action will be deemed to be statute bad. And you will not be able to bring the action anymore to recover the land from that person, because such a person will be deemed to be in adverse possession. So the question is, when does the right accrue to you to bring the action against the person? Or when does the 12 years begin to run for purpose of adverse possession? In other words, if we are saying that if somebody goes onto your land for a period of 12 years and then you don't bring any action, you begin to have lost your right. When does that 12 years begin to run? Does it run when I'm not even aware of it? Does it run even when the person is not in possession? Section 10, subsection 2 may be helpful to us. Section 10, subsection 2 says that a right of action to recover land does not accrue unless the land is in the possession of a purpose, is in possession of a person in whose favor the period of limitation can run. A right of action to recover land does not accrue unless the land is in the possession of a person in whose favor the period of limitation can run. What does this mean? What this means is that if I own the land and you are the squatter, and the squatter, you are the one in favor of whom the period of limitation of 12 years is running, it's in your favor because if the 12 years runs and I don't bring the action, you are the one who will be deemed to be the owner of the land. So, Section 10, Section 2 is saying that that's right for me to bring the action to recover. That's right does not accrue until you, the squatter, you have gone into possession of that particular land. That is when the period of limitation shall run. Now, when you read Section 10, Subsection 4 of the Limitation Act, 
it tells you that for the purpose of this act, a person is in possession of land by reason only of having made a formal entry in the land. Now, it is when you have made a formal entry that we shall say that you are a person who is in possession of land for purpose of adverse possession. So if you haven't made a formal entry on the land, how do you claim to be an adverse possessor? And how does the 12 years run for you? So if you haven't made a formal entry, then time will not begin to run. The 12 years will not begin to run for you. So the 12 years only runs for people who can be deemed to be in adverse possession of the land. People who can be de deemed or described to be people who are in adverse possession of the land. Now, one case that would be very helpful in explaining to you on what we mean by that adverse possession. Because before you can rely on the 12 year period, your possession must be adverse to the true owner. In other words, if I place you on my land and you are there with my consent, meaning that you are not there as a person whose possession is adverse to me, then it means that you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor because you are there with my permission. You are my licensee. So even if you stay there for 20 years, you cannot be deemed to be an adverse possessor because your possession of the land is not adverse to me. So adverse possession, before you can rely on Section 10 to be an adverse possessor, then your possession must be adverse to the original owner of the land. Mere possession alone will not be enough. And let me drum home the point well, the mere possession alone, which is not adverse, will not be enough. And on this, I refer you to the case of Awulai, Awulai is what A W U L A E. Awulai Atibukusu. Atibukusu is spelled A T T I B R U K U S U, the third. Awulai Atibukusu, the third, versus Opon Kofi and others. And this is. The citation for this case, you see it in Civil Appeal Number D4, Stroke 27, Stroke 2009, and the judgment is dated 29th April 2010. This is a Supreme Court decision, and this is what the Supreme Court, speaking through Bobe JSC, this is what they held. Now, before you listen to what the holding is, remember I'm saying that this case is going to demonstrate that possession alone, which is not adverse, will not entitle you to come and claim for adverse possession or limitation. Before your possession can entitle you to extinguish the rights of the true owner, then your possession must be adverse. So in Awulai Atibukusu the third versus Opon Kofi and others, this is what the Supreme Court, speaking through Bobe GSE, said, and I quote, the fact that the defendants and their fellow trespassers had trespassed, had developed the trespass land or stayed on the lands for several years were no grounds for decreeing valid title in their favor. If long possession were enough to found title in their favor, it would mean that Whenever anyone took possession of another person's property and held onto it for a very long time, he becomes the owner of that property. That kind of acquisition of ownership by long possession would lead to chaos. The principle is that long possession is valid and is evidence of title, but not against the true owner. Whenever the true owner surfaces, the one in possession should give way to that true owner. And the quote ends. So this is telling us that possession alone, no matter how long a time it is, will not suffice as making you an owner of the land. 
before possession will make you an owner, then it means that your possession must be adverse to the rights of the true owner. Now, when can possession be deemed to be adverse? Section 10, subsection 10, tries to tell us what adverse possession is, but the explanation given there will not be entirely helpful. This is what section 10, subsection 7 of the Limitation Act says, and I quote, for purpose of this section, adverse possession means possession of a person in whose favor the period of limitation can run. You see, we still do not have a clear idea of when a person who is in possession can be deemed to be an adverse possessor. The act is not entirely helpful. So we have to look at what the scholars have said about this adverse possession. And on this, I refer you to the English textbook. That is the book titled Modern Land Law. Modern Land Law, the ninth edition by Martin Dixon. Martin Dixon. When you read page 464 of the book, this is what the learned author says as far as explaining adverse possession is concerned. And I quote, in simple terms, adverse possession may be explained, may be established by demonstrating the required degree of exclusive physical possession of the land. Coupled with an intention to possess the land to the exclusion of all others, including the paper owner. It is therefore the conjunction of acts of possession with an animus possidendi, into bracket, intention to possess, that establishes adverse possession. I'll take it again. In simple terms, adverse possession may be established by demonstrating the required degree of exclusive physical possession of the land, coupled with an intention to possess the land to the exclusion of all others, including the paper owner. It is therefore the conjunction of acts of possession with an animus possidendi into bracket, an intention to possess that establishes adverse possession. And the quote ends. The learned author goes ahead to say as follows at page 465 of the book. And I quote, what is required is evidence that the adverse possessor, for whatever reason, had an intention to possess the land and put it to his own use whether or not he also knew that some other person had a claim or right to the land. And the quote ends. So you see that in order for us to establish adverse possession, whoever came on the land, we must be able to establish the animus possidendi, the intention of that person to possess to the exclusion of the whole world and to put the land to his own use. And this has been explained in the dictum of Slade J in the case of Powell. Powell is spelled P O W E L L. Powell versus McFarlane. McFarlane is spelled M C F A R L A N E. Reported in 1979, 38, in the report of P. NCR, specifically at page 452, Powell and McFarland. This is what Slade J said, and I quote, an intention in one's own name and on one's own behalf to exclude the world at large, including the paper owner, including the owner with the paper title, if he be not himself the possessor, so far as it's reasonably practicable and so far as the processes of the law would allow. So, and that, that's where the quote ends. So, in the case of 
Powell and McFarland, we are told that there must be a requisite intention that whoever is claiming to be the adverse possessor must be, have that intention to exclude the whole world at large and even the intention to exclude the original paper owner if he counts for it, so far as he can do so within the confines of the law. This is one of the elements that must be established before a person can claim to be an adverse possessor. That is animus possidendi. That is the intention to possess. Now, after establishing the intention to possess, that is the animus possidendi, the next requirement that has to be established before a person shall be deemed to be an adverse possessor is that you must prove physical possession of the land physical possession of the land. And this point has been emphasized in the case of JA, capital J, then capital A, Pi Limited. Pi is for PYE, JA Pi Limited versus Graham, reported in 2002. In this case, Lord Brown Wilkinson explained the requirement of the physical possession of the land in the following words, and I quote, The question is simply whether the defendant's quarter has dispossessed the paper owner by going into ordinary possession of the land for the requisite period without the consent of the owner, in the quote ends. So the attention over here is on the physical possession over here. Has the person exercised any act of physical possession without the consent of the true owner? If yes, then the second element for adverse possession has been established, i.e. the physical possession of the land itself. So on this requirement of physical possession of the land, once again, when you read the book titled Modern Land Law, written by Martin Dixon, the ninth edition, specifically at page 467, this is what a learned author says, and I quote, in other words, we should not seek to over-conceptualize what is adverse and what is not, but ask ourselves the simple, ordinary question. Is the claimant in possession of the land without the permission of the landowner? Seen in this light, factual possession means a sufficient degree of physical custody and control for one's own use. It is, in essence, a matter that must depend on the circumstances of each case, the particular nature of the land, and the manner in which the land is commonly used. The ultimate touchstone is, in the words of Slade J. in power, whether the alleged possessor has been dealing with the land in question as an occupying owner might have been expected to deal with it, and that no one else has done so, and that the quote ends. And so we have realized that in Ghana, it is possible that if somebody enters on your land and is an adverse possessor for a period of 12 years or more, he will be deemed to have extinguished your right as an actual owner. But when does a person become an adverse possessor? Our section 10 of the Limitation Act tells us that the person must have made a formal entry on the land. But we've also seen in cases such as Awulai, Atibrukusu, the third, versus Opon, Kofi, and others, that no matter how long your possession may be, it may not be enough to make you an adverse possessor. And so that is why we need to resolve the question. When does a person become an adverse possessor? And to become an adverse possessor, we have seen from the book titled Modern Land Law, written by Martin Dixon, ninth edition, that there are two key elements you must establish, i.e., you must establish the animus possidendi, which is the intention to possess, and you must prove also physical possession of the land in order to make you a qualified person to be an adverse possessor. 
if you are possessing land with the intention of excluding the actual owner of the land, then it means that you would have established the animus possidendi, and then you must also be in actual physical possession. Then you can qualify to be an adverse possessor. In other words, if you are on land with the permission of the landowner, and by virtue of the fact that you are on the land with the permission of the landowner, you don't intend to occupy the land for yourself. You are there as a caretaker or a licensee with the permission of the landowner. There is no way you can be deemed to be an adverse possessor. So I've heard some people mention that if you have a house and you, you keep it in the caretaker's hands, and the caretaker is there with your permission, and he stays there for 15 years, he shall be deemed to be an adverse possessor. It is not true. It is not true because such a caretaker, it is, he's there with your permission. And he's acknowledging that he's there with your permission. Year in, year out, when he comes, when you come around, you stay there with the caretaker, and then you go back. The caretaker is there and is acknowledging your title. It means that that caretaker cannot prove the animus possidendi, so he cannot be deemed to be an adverse possessor. So there are two key things that have to be established, animus possidendi and the actual physical possession. If you can't prove the animus possidendi, the intention to possess, then you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor. So remember that before possession can qualify a person to be an adverse possessor, in order to raise the limitation, your possession must be adverse to the paper owner or the actual owner of the land. And let me suppose this with some Supreme Court decisions of the Supreme Court of Ghana. And I'll start with the case of Ajete Ajay and others. Ajete is spelled A-D-J-E-T-E-Y. Ajete Ajay. Ajay is A-D-J-E-I. Ajete Ajay and others versus my boy. My is spelled capital and M-A-I. Boy, B-O-I and others. This is reported in 2013-2014 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, page 1474 at Wooden 2. And this is what the court held. And the judge that delivered the decision of the Supreme Court was so for Akufu DSC. And this is what she said, and I quote. Adverse possession must be open visible and unchallenged so as to give notice to the legal or paper owner that someone was asserting a claim adverse to his. Under the present law, the person claiming to be in possession must show either discontinuance by the paper owner followed by possession or dispossession or as, or as it is sometimes called, ouster of the paper owner. And the quote ends. And so it means that before you can say that you are an adverse possessor, your possession must be open. It must be visible. It must be unchallenged in a way that will give notice to the paper owner that another person was asserting his claim. What this means is that if you go and hide and then um, I have my land, and I'm not even aware that you are in possession. You cannot claim to be in adverse possession. Because, because your possession over there was clandestine. It was secret. The focus is that you must have given the actual owner notice that someone else is laying claim to his land. And so if you look at the Supreme Court case of Corbina Abbey and others, Corbina is called K-O-B-I-N-A. Kobina Abbey, Abbey is spelled A B B E Y. Kobina Abbey and Addis versus Nana Kofi Entry. Nana Kofi is spelled N A N A. Kofi is spelled K O F I Entry A N T W I. Kobina Abbey and Addis versus Kofi Nana Kofi Entry. This is reported in 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 17. This is what the Supreme Court said, and I quote. It is tried law that the claim of an adverse possession 
cannot be based on clandestine payments of tributes alone, as it must be open, visible, and apparent, so that it gives notice to the legal owner that someone may assert claim. So what this means is that before you can claim to be an adverse possessor, your possession must be visible, it must be open, it must be unchallenged. Then we can say that you are an adverse possessor. Now, there's one question that has usually arisen as far as the effect of a, the adverse possession is concerned. But what does it mean? Does it mean that the actual owner's interest is extinguished? The reason this question used to arise was because in time past, adverse possession was usually used only as a defense. For example, when you go and sue the squatters on the land, then the squatters would then say that they are in adverse possession. So they will use that one as a defense to prevent you from recovering the land from them. So in time past, adverse possession was only used as a shield or a defense to prevent the actual owner from recovering possession from the people who are in adverse possession. But that is not the case anymore. Because if you look at section 10, subsection 6 of the Limitation Act of 1972, NLCD 54, section 10, subsection 6 reads as follows, and I quote, on the expiration of the period fixed by this act, for a person to bring an action to recover land, the title of that person to the land is extinguished. And the quote ends. It means that the moment the 12 years passes and the person in adverse possession's right has accrued as an adverse possessor, the original owner, your right to the land stands extinguished. Now, if it is extinguished, now who is now in charge? The one in charge is now the adverse possessor. He's the one that has rights against any other person, including you, the actual owner, when you come onto the land. In other words, the one who has been held to be in adverse possession, he too can even bring an action and use the adverse possession as the basis of his title to the land. In other words, the person who is in adverse possession can even go ahead and sue and bring an action against another person. And he will rely on the adverse possession as his root of title to maintain the action. In other words, if I am an adverse possessor on your land, I can also sue another person and seek for a relief of declaration of title. And this point has been made by the Supreme Court of Ghana in the case of Gihok versus Hannah Isi. Gihok versus Hannah Asi. So Hannah is spelled H A N N A. Asi is A S S I. Reported in 2005 2006, Supreme Court of Ghana law reports paid 458 specifically as page 460. And this is what the Supreme Court held, and I quote. It is clear from this authority that title may be acquired by adverse possession. Such title, as already pointed out, is not derivative in that it does not flow from the title extinguished. Nevertheless, it is title and it is open to this court to declare that title upon a suit by the adverse possessor. Such a possessory title was held to be a good title that could be forced on a purchaser in Henry Atkinson and Hussle's contract, reported in 1912 to Chancery at page one. In my considered view, therefore, 
the possessory title of an adverse possessor can be used as a sword and not only as a shield. It follows, therefore, that the plaintiff would be entitled to a declaration of title if it were able to establish that it had been in adverse possession of the plot for more than 12 years. Supreme Court more or less affirmed the long-standing position that the adverse possessor acquires a right, one which is not derivative from the old title. It is a title on its own, and you can use that one to sustain an action and obtain an order for declaration of title to the subject matter land. Now, it is important to mention over here that as far as adverse possession is concerned, a person can claim to be an adverse possessor for a bare land or a land with building on it. In other words, if a person has claimed ownership of a particular building and then has exhibited the animus possidendi, that is the intention to possess, coupled with the actual possession of the building, and he has been in uninterrupted possession for a period of 12 years, then that person can claim to be an adverse possessor and can acquire rights over the building. And you can maintain an action for declaration of title to that particular building. This flows from the definition of land that we have under section 281 of the Land Act of 2020, Act 1036, which defines land as follows, and I quote, Land includes the solid surface of the earth, trees, plants, crops, and other vegetation, a part of the earth's surface covered by water, any house, building, or structure whatsoever, and any interest or right in, to, or over immovable property. The quote ends. So land includes a building, so adverse possession can be asserted on a bare land and also a land that even has a building on it. Now, there's this question that has arisen about whether people that have encroached on government's lands or lands that have been compulsorily acquired by the government, whether if people have encroached and exercised acts of adverse possession for a long period of time, it, that would be deemed to be enough to extinguish any rights that the government may have over such lands. And this question arose in the case of Memuna Mudi. Memuna is spelled M-E-M-U-N-A. Memuna Mudi. Mudi is spelled M-O-U-D-Y. Memuna Mudi versus Entry. Entry is spelled A-N-T-W-I. Reported in 2003-2004, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 967. Mimuna Moody versus Andrew. The reason that question arose is because of Section 30, Subsection 1 of the Limitation Act of 1972. Now, this Section 30, Subsection 1 reads as follows. Does this act apply to proceedings by or against the Republic as if the Republic were a private individual? It means that this limitation act can apply by or against the Republic. And so strictly speaking, if you go by section 31, if anybody encroaches upon government land and is able to meet those two requirements, animus possidendi and the factual possession, then that person should be able to have become an adverse possessor if he exercises the rights for a period of 12 years or more. Because Section 30, Section 1 says that the act is supposed to apply to the Republic as if the Republic were a private individual. That was why the question arose in the case of Memuna Moody versus Entry. And this is what the Supreme Court said in relation to Section 30, and then I quote. Section 30, subsection 1 of the Limitation Decree, 
1972, NRCD 54, provides that the decree is to apply to proceedings by or against the Republic as if it were a private individual. Thus, the concept of adverse possession may be applied against the states in relation to compulsorily acquired land if the necessary factual preconditions are established. In establishing these factual preconditions, however, a proponent has to be mindful of the fact that the mere occupancy of compulsorily acquired land by a person who is not a grantee of the state is not necessarily adverse possession, since it is possible for the state to give implied permission for intruders to be on this land until it is ready to use the land for the state's purposes. Adverse possession in this context refers to a situation where an unauthorized person enters or remains on the state's land and asserts rights inconsistent with the state's ownership of the land and the statute of limitation runs in favor of that person. So the court, after taking this particular position, held that the people that had encroached upon the state land were not there as adverse possessors, but they were there with the implied permission of the government. And since they were in, there with the implied permission, they would rather be construed as licensees and that their possession will not be deemed to be adverse. And these are the words of the Supreme Court in this case, and I quote, there was no evidence of any intention on the part of the father of the plaintiffs to exclude the state from his land following the acquisition. He appears to have continued his occupation of the land as a tacit licensee of the state. In the circumstances, his occupation cannot be regarded as adverse possession for the purpose of the statute of limitation. So this case of Memu Namudi versus entry lays down the position that one, adverse possession can be made in respect of land that is owned by the state. It means that if there's a state that owns a land, then a person who is in adverse possession of that particular land may have been able to extinguish the rights of the state in relation to that particular land. But in Mimuna Mudi, you see how the, 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 the judges sought to protect the state land by saying that the people who own the land were not there as adverse possessors, but rather there as licensees. Because once you're in licensee and you're there with the permission of the state, you cannot be construed to be an adverse possessor. So Memuna Mudi and Entry lays down the law that the state can be a subject, state land can be acquired by adverse possession. But I want you to know that this is not bad law. It is not bad law. That position that says that people can acquire a state land by adverse possession is not bad law. We do not want to encourage people from encroaching on state lands. So when you look at section 236 of the Land Act of 2020, Act 1036, this is what section 236 of the Land Act of 2020, Act 1036 says. And I'll read section one and subsection two. And it says as follows. Despite the provisions of the Limitation Act and any other law, a person who unlawfully occupies public land does not acquire an interest in or right over that land by reason of their occupation. Then subsection two reads as follows. A person shall not acquire by prescription or adverse possession an estate or interest in public land. So what are we being told over here? That today it is not possible that 
you can go on to state land and say that you have been there for 15 years. And so the land belongs to you. We do not want to encourage people from encroaching on state lands. So now we are saying that adverse possession cannot be raised in relation to state lands. Section 236 of the Land Act of 2020 at 1036. We did not only abolish the adverse possession in relation to state land, the lawmaker has also made it a criminal offense. So when you look at section 236, subsection 4, it reads as follows. That a person who, without reasonable excuse, the proof of what lies on that person, occupies or in any manner encroaches on or interferes with public land, commits an offense, and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than 1,000 penalty units and not more than 2,000 penalty units, or to a term of imprisonment of not less than one year and not more than three years, or to both. So you see, now we have not only said that you cannot have, you cannot have adverse possession in relation to state land. Now we have not only abolished adverse possession in relation to state land, we have made it unlawful and illegal for people to go onto state lands and trespass on it before they will now come and tell us that they are rather adverse possessors. Now it's even criminal to encroach or interfere with the public land. So if it's criminal, how can you even come and claim to be an adverse possessor? Section 236 of the Land Act of 2020 has abolished adverse possession in relation to state land. So now Memuna Moody and entry that held that a state land can be acquired by compulsory by, by adverse possession. That Memuna Moody and entry is now bad law because the prevailing law is section 236 of the Land Act of 2020, Act 1036. Having said so, having said so. Now we know what the requirements of adverse possession are. That there must be the animus possidendi and there must be the actual physical possession. We know that when you are exercising adverse possession, your possession must be adverse to the actual owner of the land. If it's not adverse, but it is there with the permission of the owner of the land, you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor. But I have a question which has to be answered. And it is that assuming there's somebody who has taken over my land, assuming I live in Accra and I have a land at Tamale, and somebody has taken over my land and is exercising act of ownership, and maybe I'm in Accra and I even have a stroke, or I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm in the hospital and I'm not aware of it, and the person exercised the act of ownership for over 15 years, can the person still be deemed to be an adverse possessor that would extinguish my rights? Or assuming your father has left a property for you in his will, and at the time when he left the property for you in his will and then he died, you were about just four years old, or you were about three years old. And so now, when they gave the property to you and the will was read and vesting assets was executed or whatever was done and the property has not been given to you, you were not, you, in fact, you couldn't do anything about it because you were just three years old. Meanwhile, somebody has taken the land is exercising acts of ownership to the knowledge of the whole world. What happens? When you are now 18 years, by then, the person would have occupied the land for about 15 years, and you sue him and is now claiming to be an adverse possessor. What does the law say about it? Look at Section 16 of the Limitation Act. Section 16 of the Limitation Act deals with the extension in case of disability. So that if a person is under a disability, then time is not supposed to run against that particular person. If you look at section 16, subsection 1, it says that where on the date when a right of action accrued, for which a period of limitation is fixed by this act, the person to whom is accrued was under a disability the period of the disability shall not, subject to this section, be taken into account in computing the relevant period of limitation. And if you look at section 16, subsection 6, 
It says that a person is under disability while that person is an infant or of unsound mind. So you see, once the person is an infant or of unsound mind, then it means that that period that he was an infant is not supposed to be calculated as far as determining the 12-year period is concerned. It is only when the person attains the age of majority that the period will not begin to run for that particular person. So if you are three years, from the three years till you became, attain the age of majority, time will not begin to run for you. That's section 16 of the Limitation Act. So what we have done so far by way of summary in this lecture is that we started the lecture by making it clear that no matter how long a person has been in possession of land, he will not be deemed to be the owner. That possession, no matter how long, shall not ripen into ownership. But we mentioned that if you are in possession of land, then under the Evidence Act, you are presumed to be the owner. And the case law told us that you can maintain an action against anybody in the world apart from the true owner. So we then have to look at how then can you extinguish the rights of the true owner? Then we came to Section 10 of the Limitation Act. That told us that if you're an adverse possessor for a period, a continuous period of 12 years, then your, your, your period of adverse possession shall extinguish the rights of the actual owner of the land. Then we also identified that the effect of adverse possession is that it extinguishes any rights that the actual owner may have in the land. Then we remember the case of Gihok versus Hanaisi that says that once you are an adverse possessor, you can maintain an action in your own name to even get a declaration of title to the land because the original owner's title has been extinguished by Section 10. And we identified the two elements of, of adverse possession, that there must be the animus possidendi and there must be the factual possession in order to prove what adverse possession is. And you remember, we mentioned that once a person is on the land with the permission of the actual owner, then it means that his possession is not what? Adverse to the actual owner's possession of the land. And so if a caretaker is on the land, a licensee is on the land with the permission of the actual owner, if the caretaker is there for 15 years, he cannot claim to be an adverse possessor because he is there with the permission of the actual owner of the land. And then remember, we look at the case of Mimuna Moody and Entry. That even gives support to the position that if you're on land with the permission of the owner, then you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor. And remember what we saw on our Land Act of 2020, that today, nobody can claim to be an adverse possessor in relation to land that is owned by the government of Ghana. Lands that have been compulsory acquired, you cannot claim to be an adverse possessor to extinguish the rights of the government of Ghana in relation to that land. This brings us to the end of our lecture on adverse possession and the interrogation of when long possession can ripen into ownership. Thank you.